This morning we continue our Advent journey toward Christmas as we walk through these four weeks together, this time of waiting and anticipation. We are exploring some of the signs and symbols associated with this season. Every week we've been looking at uh, one of these Christmas or Christ monograms as they're known. Uh, we find decorating our Christmas tree over here uh, to your right in the sanctuary. This week we are focusing on the symbol of the dove, as I told our children just a moment ago. The image of the dove is most often associated with the Holy Spirit in the church. And as we consider scriptural stories related to the Holy Spirit, the baptism of Jesus is often one of the first ones that we think of. The Holy Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus as he comes up fresh from the waters of baptism. God speaking, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And that baptism was performed by the person at the very center of our scripture reading today, John the Baptist. The beginning of this morning's scripture passage, though, is one that we often jump over. Uh, it's kind of like those begats that you get in the Old Testament. You just kind of skip over that part because it's a bunch of hard names that nobody knows how to pronounce. I just say it firmly and you all believe I know how to do it. Uh, but really, uh, we jump over those a lot of the time because most of us didn't take uh, ancient Near Eastern civics class in high school. So our eyes sort of glaze over and we jump over that and get to the good stuff. But these names are actually important. They give us some historical significance to this moment that we are remembering this morning. Not necessarily who the people are, but who they represent. The writer of Luke's gospel uh, said that he was determined to give an orderly account of Jesus' life. So he is trying to dot all his I's, cross all his T's, make sure that everybody knows exactly what he's saying is true. So listing the names of these officials... Uh, is actually something very important because before the time in which calendars were kept, the only way to know when something happened was in what year of what emperor something happened. So Luke gives all of these vectors to pinpoint exactly when and where John is doing this new thing. So he starts with the Roman emperor Tiberius, the most important man in the world at that time. Then he goes down to the provincial governance level of who is in charge of the local area and finally to the local high priesthood who was in charge of that area's religious and civic life. Now, along with giving us a date and a place where all this occurring is occurring, there is also a fair amount of political intrigue that is represented between the lines of these various names. Questions of who's in charge who's really in charge of things. The emperor Tiberius is the emperor in charge of everything in the empire, but below him is a rather complex organizational chart of power squabbles and power-hungry men. Herod the Great, who was once in charge of this entire area, has passed away and he has handed down his lands, divided it among his four sons, three of whom seem to do an excellent job, one of whom is sort of a rogue and ne'er-do-well who is so incompetent that they had to hand over his portion to someone that we all know, Pontius Pilate. And it says there are two high priests listed here, but actually in history books, there's only ever one high priest serving at one time. You see, Anas had retired and handed over his title to his son Caiaphas, but everyone knew who was really still in charge. And I had all the power, all the influence. So both of them get listed here. Everyone is trying to hold on to something or grab some power for themselves. And yet, despite all these power plays, all these titles, all this jockeying for position and influence, the word of God bypasses all of these people and lands on John the son of Zechariah, a local priest. In our modern context, it would be like, we're going to jump over the president, the governor, we're going to go over the bishop's head, the district superintendent, and we're going to go down to Maggie, John Mulaney's daughter in the church, and she's going to receive the word of God. Maggie didn't like that example in the first service. But John listens to the word of God, follows where it leads. Last week, uh, in the first service, we talked about how we prepare the exterior parts of our lives for the season. We talked a lot about decorations and the meaning of that here during the Hanging of the Green service. 
how all these decorations, all of these things that change in our sanctuary, in our homes, are actually meant to stir in us an internal change, an internal transformation, a spiritual change that prepares us for Christmas. And this week, John the Baptist doubles down on that imagery. John sees himself as a messenger coming before a king. Now, in this time period, kings, emperors, governors would often do a little tour of the land that they were in charge of, a little tour of homes, not quite as nice as the ones we do here in Huntsville. But they would go around and they would look at all of their lands and say, look at how rich and powerful I am. All these people will bow before me and do as I ask them to do. Now, the way that they prepared for that is they would send a courier, a harbinger, a messenger ahead of them to prepare the towns to make sure that everything was up to snuff, up to muster. Make sure the roads were maintained, the local officials were in place, the riffraff were removed, and everyone was smiling and dancing when they appeared. John sees himself in much the same He comes preaching this new message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. He cries out that this Messiah, this King, this one is coming. And John doesn't know when it's going to happen. He just trusts that God has spoken into his heart. And he's coming and he's coming soon. So you all better get ready. It's about getting your heart and soul right before the King arrives. And that's really what this Advent season is all about. It's why we read these words year after year after year. But it can be difficult to do. It's often hard to enter into this season in what we consider the right spirit. We're told to be happy and jolly and joyful. But for many of us, that's hard. It's a difficult time, especially this time of year. We feel pressure from so many different fronts that we're not doing it right or not meeting people's needs or expectations. I must confess to a certain scroogeiness that can invade my heart. I'm not above the occasional bah humbug. Looking back at some of my previous Advent sermons, I'm impressed people came back for Christmas. Everybody I know wants to be in the Christmas spirit, but some years are harder than others. The more I think about it, the more I've come to believe that the feeling of the Christmas spirit is more about listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can be hindered by all sorts of different things in our world and in our lives in this busy season. The biggest issue, though, for me, and I think for many people, is listening. Listening for where it is calling us to go. Going where it leads. Because we're just so busy. There's so much on our plate, so much to accomplish, so much to get done in a very short period of time, not to mention the fact that we, for some reason, believe or think that we can manage the joy and happiness of others. But here's the thing I've come to understand in my 40 years. You can't manufacture joy. You cannot manufacture an experience. In fact, there are only two people I can think of that can do that. Martha Stewart and Walt Disney, and I'm neither one of those. The truth is that the greatest experiences I've ever had in Advent or at Christmas have come about when I have been willing to embrace the unexpected, the surprise, the unplanned. When I was open to where the Holy Spirit led and our plans changed and all of a sudden something amazing happened. As we consider the story that we've read this morning, We find that all of this happens only because John the Baptist is willing to go where God leads. The word of God finds John. The spirit moved and John responded. See, that's the thing about how God operates often in the Bible then and now. The word of God interrupted John's life. The Holy Spirit interrupts our lives. You see, the Holy Spirit isn't interested in our plans. He doesn't care about our carefully laid out calendar, our to-do list, or our safety and our security. The Spirit just moves. Sometimes it's gentle as a whisper, a nudge, a push. Sometimes it comes like a hurricane wind and a mighty shove, and all of a sudden we're out in the deep water and we don't know how we got there. Something about John's willingness to go where God leads, though, It's contagious. 
And as he is moving about in the wilderness, preaching in the desert places, sharing this message of repentance and forgiveness, the people respond. Depending on the gospel account you read, some translations say that all the people in the region around the Jordan River came to be baptized by John. This was a a movement. But think about that willingness. If you were in the same position today, what would it take to convince you to travel out into the wilderness, a deserted, lonely place, to go see someone about some forgiveness? Who would have to be out there for you to take that kind of risk? Is there anyone that you'd leave the comfort and safety and security of your home to go see in a desert place? In a place far out and inconvenient and away from your home? Me? Probably not. I'm too comfortable. But then again, God's message has always been to the poor and the dispossessed. God works in the hearts of desperate people. And the people we find in today's story are desperate. All you have to do is look at that long list of people we just talked about. All the people who hold power over their lives. People they will never see, they'll never lay eyes on, they'll never know. People who control every aspect of their lives up to and including when their lives might end. They're under Roman rule. They're also living under the impossible burden of a religious system of law that is impossible for them to keep. They're just desperate for hope. And hope is what John the Baptist is offering them. So they go out into the desert place. The more comfortable we are, the harder it can be to hear the Holy Spirit. It's not impossible, but we certainly have to listen harder. We have to intentionally listen and make space. As I told the children earlier, sometimes you just have to find a little quiet in the midst of the madness to allow God to speak into the quiet. We have to slow down. We have to allow ourselves to be moved. Because when you make the space, you may be surprised at how the Spirit moves or speaks into your life. You may feel called or nudged or pushed or pulled or encouraged to change something in your life or to do something new. And you may say to yourself, self, I should really do this. I feel convinced. I feel sure. I feel certain. I feel convicted that this is the path that I should take. This is the action I need to put into practice. This will transform my life. This will share love into the lives of other people. I can do this. I should do this. I will do this. And you're so excited about it. I can do this. I should do this. I will do this. Over and over again, you say to yourself, and then over the period of some time, whether it's a few weeks or a few days or even a few minutes, you move to, I should do this tomorrow. I will do this next week. I can do this when my life is more together, when I'm more financially secure, when things aren't so crazy at work. I'm going to get around to it, I promise. And it gets pushed further and further and further back. Don't wait for later. Don't wait for the time to be right. A lot of times these are limited time offers. Why do we think that we can treat the Holy Spirit like a magic eight ball? Y'all remember the magic eight ball, the big plastic ball? You shake it and you turn it over and it's got some different sayings on the inside that's supposed to tell you what you're supposed to do. You shake it and you say, should I ask the pretty girl to the dance? My sources say no. Tip. Oh, good. Yes, definitely. We do the same thing with the Holy Spirit. Should I get involved in that ministry at church? Should I help this person on the street who needs my help? Should I do something different with my life this year? Oh, it's decidedly so. Tip. Ask again later. I like that better. We will seek out Holy Spirit loopholes anywhere we can. We will talk ourselves out of it. We will wait so long that the urgency of our conviction flares out. We don't think about it. We don't pray about it. We don't talk to God about it. We just wait it out. You have probably done this. I know that I have. We say to ourselves, if I still feel like this tomorrow, 
If I still feel like this next week, then I'll do it. I don't want to be hasty. I don't, I don't want to rush into anything. This could just be indigestion. I had Taco Bell for lunch. You know, imagine the Holy Spirit. I imagine the Holy Spirit looking at us, seeing that little hourglass spinning like on the computer, the little spinning wheel of death. And we send the Holy Spirit an error message that says, sorry, your request timed out. The other side of the coin is we put the Holy Spirit to the test. Say, all right, ghosty ghost, I need you to tell me by 10 p.m. Central Time, no tricks, whether or not you really want me to do this. I'm going to need you to give me a clear sign. I want this Old Testament style, burning bush, pillar of flame, voice from heaven. If I don't hear from you, I'm going to take your silence as permission to do nothing. Thank you. Amen. We give a Holy Spirit deadline. Even when we know. Even when we know what we're supposed to do. The problem is rarely that the Holy Spirit does not speak. But that we fail to listen and act. In this Advent season. I implore you to follow the example of John the Baptist who heard the word of God, who experienced the spirit move and respond. Don't wait. Don't talk yourself out of it. Don't look for a loophole, but instead say to yourself, I can do this. I should do this. I will do this.